You are listening to the podcast of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. We report on the leading role that new technologies play in the context of the global information society, interviewing academics and industry leaders. Rebecca McKinnon, you are a person with one foot in journalism and another foot in academia. How did you get there where you are right now? Was that a, a, a sort of choice um, to do both? Well, it was a long process. Uh, it's, it's sort of a long answer. I, I worked for CNN for 12 years. I was in China for nine years and in Japan for three years. And in 2004, I, I just went on leave from my job at CNN for, I thought it would just be a semester to spend some time as a fellow at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just became very fascinated what, with what was happening on the internet at that time in 2004 with cit citizen journalism and blogging really emerging and, and having real impact challenging both conventional media and you know, governments and, and you know, sort of political power and so on. And I was very interested to, to follow that more, particularly on the international side, and I had spent a lot of time in China, so I was very interested to see what was happening with the internet in China. So for a lot of reasons that we probably don't have time to go into, I was also getting a bit frustrated with my job at CNN, feeling mm -hmm. that uh, there was less and less opportunity to do in-depth journalism there. So I thought it was a good time to you know, explore other other things. So I ended up staying at Harvard for three years, mainly at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, uh, and began to do research uh, on the Chinese internet, on free expression issues, uh, the role of uh, corporations in censorship and surveillance, uh, and also was also kind of an NGO activist mm -hmm. at the same time. I started mm -hmm. Global Voices, which mm -hmm. is a citizen media platform uh, and community, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm still somewhat involved with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Hong Kong for a couple of years to teach mm -hmm. and, and uh, then sort of did some more independent research. And now i am sort of got one foot in policy, one foot in journalism, maybe a third foot in academia or something, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's so... Uh, I'm not really a traditional academic in any kind of sense, mm -hmm. but um, I found that I wasn't able to do the kind of work that I wanted to do in if journalism. I stayed mm -hmm. at a traditional news organization, mm -hmm. and that I, I wanted to get more in depth, uh, both in terms of research, but I also had a, a, a point of view mm -hmm. that I thought, you know, th there. I, I, I couldn't be neutral, I guess yeah, I had to yeah, say. <laughs> you know, I, I had yeah. to take a more advocacy yeah. stance. And and so for those reasons, uh -huh. I sort of moved away from mainstream journalism. So do you think uh, the internet makes it easier to shift uh, and uh, reinterpret one's role? Is it uh, easier to sort of do um, policy, academic uh, work and journalism at the same time? Uh, to some extent, I think that's true. I mean, certainly um, with the internet, it's possible to kind of be, develop credibility just as yourself. Yes. So yeah. I think in the pre-internet world, Rebecca yeah. McKinnon without an institution um, would not have much legitimacy or credibility. But uh, that I would have to have a university or a brand media or something yeah. where people are like, who are you? Yeah you know, why should we listen to you? Yeah. But I think because of the internet, people find my writing, they see my work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more sort of, of an, kind of an individual player, yes. and I've been switching institutional mm -hmm. affiliations mm -hmm. quite frequently. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, on the other hand, uh, it, it's certainly, uh, you know, just on a more practical level for young people starting out, um, just, you know, kind of word of warning and all of this, it also leads to a lot less job security. So I'm currently, I have a fellowship right now. It ends in August. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how I will pay my rent after that. So mm -hmm. I go from year to year or, you know, yeah. contract to contract uh, without any particular um, long-term stability. So, that so that's, yeah, have, that's the case for... Who yeah. seem to think, yeah. Yeah, who <laughs> think that they have long-term employment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. In, in this age, I think, yeah. you know, we, we kind of create mm -hmm. our own platforms mm -hmm. and we're constantly having to be entrepreneurial also to figure out how do I support the 
work I'm going to do, yeah. um, both yeah. institutionally and just you know yeah. much more practically. Now there is one issue I wanted to get into, and that is mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between private and public censorship, sort of governmental and corporate mm -hmm. censorship. You've been working on that. How do you see the interplay between mm -hmm. the two? Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the interplay can vary and, and is sometimes very blatant and sometimes quite subtle, sort mm -hmm. of depending on where it's taking place. On the country? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, it, you know, um, and also sometimes companies conduct censorship for their own reasons. Uh, so in a place like China, of course, uh, you have the most kind of blatant situation where the government... Uh, expects companies to take responsibility for the political behavior mm -hmm. of their users. Mm -hmm. And if the users are using their platform to conduct political activities that the government does not want mm -hmm. happening, the, the company can potentially lose its business license if yeah. they're not quick enough to, yeah. to address this problem. So, and so the censorship mm -hmm. is, is quite direct. Um, but there are many other situations. For instance, Apple, uh, Apple Computer with its iPhone apps and iPad apps and so on, um, it will do kind of both. So for instance, its app store in China, uh, they, at the Chinese government demand, they censor many apps, you know, mm -hmm. the Dalai Lama app, mm -hmm. you know, you know any, anything that might be politically controversial mm -hmm. and prevent them from mm -hmm. doing business in China. But they also conduct a lot of their censorship just of their own but Volition. What, so, what for instance, that? Stern this, magazine yeah. was their yeah, app no, was I was censored. Yeah, there yeah. are political cartoons in the United States yeah. that are censored by Apple just because the company is afraid of controversy. So, is it preemptive censorship? It's, it's basically preemptive censorship. They're trying to enforce a certain environment or set of values, um, and you also have different. So, for instance, um, in in more indirect ways. For instance, Facebook requires that its users uh, register with their real names. And while it's not enforced uh, uh, consistently, you can lose your account if you are reported to not be using your real name. And so that's kind of, in effect, ends up being a kind of censorship mm -hmm. on people who are too vulnerable yeah. to be using their real identi yeah, identities. Right. The intention, however, is to create a pleasant environment and you know prevent children from being harassed mm -hmm. and make it easy try to mm -hmm. try to encourage accountable mm -hmm. accountable behavior mm -hmm. um, and also I think prevent liability mm -hmm. for the company and it's also much easier to commercialize the service yeah. if people are using their real yeah. names so there are a lot of commercial reasons why companies end up censoring um, or preventing certain yeah. applications or, or just kind of constraining certain kinds of applications which are not their preferred business partners mm -hmm. um, and, and giving preference to some things over another, which may be for commercial reasons, but it ends up having an effect on freedom of expression and, and freedom of assembly mm -hmm. as well as more and more people are reliant yeah. on these. Yeah. So, so the two sometimes combine in a very direct way, mm -hmm. sometimes they combine in a yeah. more indirect yeah. way. Um, and again, the, the, the issue is how does the citizen navigate all these things and, and hold the companies more accountable while still also holding governments accountable. I've been wondering, um, social networks such as Facebook, they seem to form a hybrid. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, one could say it's a commercial corporate space, mm -hmm. and why shouldn't Facebook be allowed to, to set once. the rules uh, on its private premises? Right. So on the other hand, uh, somebody recently said that they become similar to utilities, public yeah. utilities. Mm -hmm. So they seem to Im be in between and what we see right. from a, a free speech perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not really clear to what kind of rules they should actually respond. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, we it's, use public pressure yeah. to make them more like mm -hmm. public entities that have to follow basic democratic rules. Mm -hmm. But they probably think rather as this as their private Absolutely. premise. Absolutely. They they feel that uh, that uh, they should not their their right to operate as a private business should not be interfered with. Yeah. Um, and there is a question about often, I think, whether legislation is the best way to address yeah. this problem yeah. or whether there needs to be some other kind yeah. of solution yeah. worked out that's kind of between 
the public, the users, and the service yeah. that provides accountability and trust and ensures that the, the service is not operating in a manner that is curtailing people's rights. Um, but we don't have good mechanisms for that. Uh, and, uh, and part of the problem is, too, then you end up having legislation, some, some of which is quite good, but others of which end up constraining the well, innovation of, well, and, yeah. and so, yeah. so it's, uh, we don't sort of have the right structures and mechanisms and, and what institutions. what is your take on it? What do you think and what mm -hmm. direction will it develop? Yeah. Well, I, I think that really depends on how much people get involved with this, how aware people become how active people become uh -huh. in asserting really their citizen, uh -huh. their netizenship yeah. of the internet. Um, you know, if people, you know, don't care, uh, you know, ab about their physical city and who is running it and how they yeah. run it, and they don't actively get involved with with the civic life of the mm -hmm. city, then they may perhaps have only themselves to yeah. blame if it's being run by people who are not running it very well. And so similarly with the internet, I think people increasingly need to assert kind of netizenship within the internet. So one of the open questions would be the division of labor between social movements yeah. and governmental regulation. Is mm -hmm. that how you would see it? Mm -hmm. That if there is enough social movement uh, pushing for uh, basic standards, then mm -hmm. we don't need governmental mm -hmm. intervention, is that how you see it? Uh, well, it's probably even more complicated than that because, you know, as, as the speaker after me, Mr. Mueller, was, was, was talking about, just it, it's more about governance rather than government. And yeah. it, it may be that yeah. governmental institutions as we've come to know them yeah. may not actually work so well yeah. uh, in the internet age, yeah. in a globally networked world. Okay. And so there's absolutely, a role for governance, yeah. um, but how that is exercised yeah. and and how it works yeah. through through corporate networks um, and whether that goes through a you know mm -hmm. elected public body or whether yeah. there's governance that's yeah. happening directly between the users and the company. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think there's there's going to have to be a lot of innovation worked out. I mean, you know, I think we're we're entering a period, perhaps. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, as one of the other speakers mentioned, of perhaps the next hundred years ago of where we're really going to have to be think, rethinking a lot of things fundamentally. So it means the way we have to imagine governance is sort of several triangles, mm. civil society, governments, mm. and, uh, and corporations, corporations and, and civil then, society can yeah. push towards uh, um, better rules mm. uh, towards governments, but also can try to influence provide us directly. Yeah, I think so. I think that's... Uh, so it's a multi-stakeholder approach, exactly. but we don't know really how it will play out in what context right. and how what country. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because of course, you, you know, we're not going for one world yeah. government here. You know, it's yeah. going to have to be a much more yeah. multi-layered thing. Uh, but on the other hand, how do we ensure yeah. the public interest is yeah. is served? You know, but it's we, government. Yeah. Uh, they, we need to sort of push for democratic rights to ensure Absolutely. Yeah. that yeah. We, we need to be involved with what our governments are doing and, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and, yeah. and really try to understand yeah. the broader issues. So let me finish with a personal question. What do you think you will do next? What will be your mm. next topic now that you've that's, finished your book? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, one of the big issues um, that I see is that uh, there's just not enough public awareness, mm -hmm. I think. Um, a, about many of the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. I think in part that's just because the way the media is structured is, is kind of not part of the type of thing they normally cover. I think the internet governance battles that are happening yeah. is largely unreported. Yes, that's true. Uh, and so one of the things, and again, I'm not sure how, I'm still figuring out kind of where to go practically, but uh, find a way to, to provide better public information, you know, so not only on an academic level, mm -hmm. But how can how can we make how can whether it's an information platform that needs to be built or just kind of push for more coverage in different mm -hmm. ways? Um, how to build much broader public awareness and get mm -hmm. more people involved mm -hmm. um, in these discussions? Mm -hmm. Because I think the more that these discussions are happening amongst political and business elites. Mm -hmm and only academic yeah. elites in language that, yeah. you know, acronyms and so on that yeah. ordinary people don't understand, understand. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's dangerous.
So that would be the advocacy mm -hmm. perspective. And yeah. in terms of research, do you have any mm -hmm. ideas what you would like to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm going to have to sort of see going forward. I think a lot of it has to do again with uh, how to uh, sort of looking at this interface between where government power and corporate power intersect. Yeah. Yeah and finding ways to yeah. help people understand that better yeah. and, and to understand a little better how the two kinds of mm -hmm. power interplay. I see a beautiful comparative project here <laughs> to look at how it happens in the US, how it happens in various, mm -hmm. say, European countries. Yeah. That would be a very good thing that would to be do. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much.